Oh, they've given me a step up in the world, which I need, being just five foot and a bit. Um, now, I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to come and speak to you today about what I like to describe as the heart of the matter, the patient experience of healthcare, and how that experience can actually drive change, drive change in all areas of care, by involvement in policy making, regulation, education, uh, standard setting, but most importantly, at the coalface, at the point of interaction, that interaction between the healthcare professional and the individual patient. But I also want to pose the question, who are you to us? Who are you to we patients? How do we view, view you? Well, we see you as, um, I suppose, privileged people, possessing of high-grade intellect, having benefited from superb training, but most importantly, as people who are gifted with a very real opportunity of serving humankind on a daily basis. And that is truly awesome. However, I'm also prompted to ask the question, should the patient be a passive individual in the care process, especially when you consider that the patient and the family are present throughout the full continuum of care? They're there for the long haul. Different uh, professionals dip in and out, but the patient is there all the time. Is a repository of useful information, does not always experience seamless continuity of care, but certainly sees things through a very different lens, things which busy healthcare workers may miss. And most importantly, he is undoubtedly the individual with the greatest investment in the outcome. So I suppose to set context and background, I'm the external lead advisor of the WHO Patients for Patient Safety Programme, which advocates for a culture of safe care that is more inclusive of patient and family. The report Safety First 2006 says that around the world, those organisations that are most successful in improving patient safety are those that encourage close cooperation with patients and families. So how should, if you like, patient engagement and patient safety play out in the 21st century? Well, Michael Leonard, physician leader for uh, patient safety at Kaiser Permanente, does offer a simple definition of a culture of safe care. He says that no one is ever hesitant to speak up regarding the well-being of a patient. Everyone has a high degree of confidence that their concern will be heard respectfully and acted upon. Lucien Lee back in 2008 said the time is now. If health and or healthcare is on the table, then the consumer, the public, the patient, the family member must be at that table. And when? Now. Not in 12 months' time. Now, he said that in 2008. How far advanced are we on that road in 2014? While the Irish Commission on Patient Safety and Quality Assurance describes a patient safety framework as knowledgeable patients receiving safe and effective care from skilled professionals in appropriate environments and with assessed outcomes. So when that happens, it can then become uh, a situation where the patient experience can act as a catalyst for change in this improved health service. Uh, care becomes, if you like, more patient-centred. The reality is that in relation to events, to mishaps, we can't change the past. But what we can do is we can use that past to inform the present, and then in the present we can influence the future. And isn't it so much better if we do that together in partnership and all of that can be summarised as a process of empowerment of patients and families by enablers within the system. And sometimes I certainly acknowledge that that can be difficult to achieve. I have heard Jim Conway, Senior Vice President of IHI, describe that uh, engagement process, that, that dynamic, as making the status quo uncomfortable while making the future attractive. And I think that's a lovely expression. And 
I suppose, put in another way, I think of advocates like myself as somewhat like a piece of grit in the oyster, causing suf sufficient irritation to bring about the pearl. And in this case, the pearl is that very precious pearl of healthcare improvement. I certainly, for one, have had the great good fortune to have encountered many enablers within the healthcare system. People who are prepared to lose sight of safe dry land while on the voyage of discovery, that improvement journey. People with vision. But sadly, we all know that there are those who resist change, are unable or are unwilling to leave the comfort zone. And I suspected it was such that Helen Keller had in mind when she said, there is one thing worse than being blind, and that is having sight, but no vision. So what are we patients asking of healthcare? Uh, we're asking that the system and that individual practitioners within that system conduct the business of healthcare in a culture of openness, transparency, and true professionalism. And in so doing, they would prove themselves worthy of the trust placed in them by vulnerable patients and by concerned carers. And in that regard, it's really interesting to consider the result of a survey we in the Irish Me Medical Council conducted a year or so ago. And it was to ascertain public perceptions in relation to the different professions. And 88% of those respondents said they trusted their doctors to tell the truth. And I wasn't at all surprised at that result because, after all, you are the people who hold our lives in your hands and you are the people that we patients want to hold in high regard. So isn't it all the more unacceptable when sometimes that level of trust can be betrayed? So it is in the context of all of that that it falls to me to use the patient experience, that of my own 21-year-old son, Kevin, as a means of first identifying some of the challenges in providing safe care, together with gaining some kind of insight in what, into what it is like for patient, family, and clinician when things go wrong. So consequently, the burning question for me is that basic one. Can the patient experience be a catalyst for change? Now, for your part, you might also put the question, well, we're highly trained professionals. Why should we listen to the likes of Margaret Murphy, a lay person? What is she to offer? What can she bring to, to the table? So in response, I offer you the Indian proverb, tell me a fact and I'll learn. Tell me a truth and I'll believe. Tell me a story and it will live in my heart forever. And patients like my Kevin certainly have very powerful stories to tell. The most effective tool we patients have is to tell those stories, and why? Because those stories evoke feelings. It was back in 1967 that Vera Keen wrote in the Bulletin of Nurse Midwifery, facts do not change feelings, and feelings are what influence behaviour. The accuracy, the clarity with which we absorb information has little effect on us. It's how we feel about that information that determines whether we will use it or not. And I certainly remember quite recently I gave a talk in London and when I was in the lift leaving the building, a Welsh doctor was uh, also in the same lift and he said, um, thank you Margaret, I'm taking a lot home, pointing first to his head and then to his heart. And yes, we need both. We need the head and heart piece. It's also very true that simple measures save lives. Simple measures were not taken and Kevin lost his life. It's also true that in the case of the, very acute, uh, of the acutely ill patient, there is often quite a long antecedent period during which successful intervention is possible. And for Kevin, that period spanned almost two years, but no one took advantage of that time. So let us proceed then. I offer you the ultimate official data in relation to Kevin. It's his death certificate. It lists primary hyperparathyroidism, hypercalcemia, uh, multi-organ failure. Uh, it's not usual for somebody to die from primary hyperparathyroidism, especially when blood tests revealed high levels of calcium almost two years before his death. Adverse events happen to real people. 
Kevin was more than a statistic, he was more than a medical condition, he was a young man full of life at the threshold of his adult life and uh, he certainly could push all his mother's buttons. He was a very challenging young boy. He could make me proud of him, happy about him, disappointed in him, angry. Uh, he did push all his mum's buttons. But above all, he, he was my beautiful boy, handsome, strong and carefree. Kevin was admitted to hospital eight days following, uh, following this picture. Uh, Three days following that, uh, that admission, I sat at his bedside in ICU with his sister. Kevin had died right before our eyes. Nothing or no one had prepared us for this. We had questions, we needed answers. How can a young man go to hospital on Thursday and be dead on Sunday? What went wrong? Please explain to us. We need to know, we need to understand. What we encountered was closing ranks, lame excuses, muddying of the waters, and protestations of loyalty to colleagues. So disappointed and frustrated, we retraced Kevin's medical history over the previous three years. That we had to do without support. I found myself having to ask questions which were difficult to articulate and hear answers that were very difficult to hear. And the story slowly and painfully unfolded. The failings and shortcomings were many in number. They were serious in nature. They were indicative of system breakdown, which was compounded by misdiagnosis, inappropriate treatment and management, together with issues of communication and data handling. And in particular, I would ask you to keep in mind uh, how, labor how laboratory results were mishandled how those results provided sufficient data which, if interpreted correctly and acted in, upon promptly, certainly would have, changed, uh, would have saved his life. And in fact, the, uh, the potential to achieve proper diagnosis and treatment was sabotaged. It was sabotaged by that inaction and by not taking proper account of the results. And all of those errors ranged from his treatment at primary care level right through to that afforded him in a tertiary training hospital. And that is why I say every point of contact failed him. So what was that unfolding story? During 97, Kevin presented on a number of occasions with persistent back pain. Without any improvement, he was referred to an orthopaedic consultant in the autumn of that year. Blood tests revealed high levels of calcium at 3.51 in a normal, very narrow range of 2.05 to 2.75. Other parameters were also raised, and all those abnormal results were highlighted in some way in the laboratory report. However, when writing to the GP, the consultant made very little emphasis on the high calcium levels, didn't make a referral, and totally ignored a plasma creatinine level, which already indicated a, a more than 50% loss of overall renal function. And uh, that letter, in fact, is not on the GP's file. So while we know the letter was written, we don't know if it was posted, we don't know if it, we, if it was delivered. All we really do know is that it certainly wasn't acted upon. And as a consequence, the consultant's intention to see Kevin early in the new year was never conveyed to either him or any member of the family. And I suppose it's also significant that throughout Kevin's care, only one set of clinical eyes saw those blood test results in their entirety. At no point in his care was the hard copy forwarded, and neither did it travel with Kevin as part of a patient health record. And I'd certainly see that as a useful thing to have, a patient held record. Uh, no one, patient or clinician, had the opportunity to revisit them and give the patient the benefit of that second pair of eyes. I would say that the opportunity to initiate best practice was thwarted. It was thwarted by firstly not recognising the seriousness of his condition and then the absence of a system to flag the high calcium readings in a way that would insist on immediate referral and of course not in, uh, communicating the test results in their entirety and again preventing the patient from the benefit of that. 
Kevin's file actually contains a notation by the doctor's secretary. Telephone call from patient's mother. She's extremely worried about her son. She wishes you to know that she thinks he may be depressed also. Failed his first year exams, repeating and not doing well either, finding it hard to study. He's now remaining in bed a lot. She has arranged an appointment with Dr. X, a psychiatrist, tomorrow, and would like to have results of blood tests, bone scan, etc., for the consultation. Now, you might ask, what in God's name are they doing taking this young man to see a psychiatrist? Well, we had exhausted all other avenues, and he was repeatedly returned to us as seemingly healthy. Uh, she wonders if he really has a back problem. What can I tell the mother? She wished to speak to you. Results in file. And the doctor's response, fax results to Dr. X. There was no direct contact with the patient, and there was no direct contact with the mother. Carers and family members are often dismissed as being over-anxious, and I would say you ignore at your peril the concerns of a mother. I assure you, and the mums in the audience will know this, that umbilical cord is never totally severed. The patient and the family are critical components in the integrated care process, and my understanding that one of the aims of an integrated care pathway is to improve that clinician-patient communication and, of course, patient satisfaction. And sadly, very often, the missing link in that can be the patient. So after repeated consultations, Kevin was returned to us as seemingly healthy and without e explanation for his sometimes very unacceptable behaviour. And only later did we learn that that was due to the chemical imbalance caused by his undiagnosed medical condition and the fact that while his bones were being starved and softening, including the bones in his brain, the viscosity of his blood was being altered and putting a huge strain on his heart. When adjudicating on the quality of Kevin's care, uh, peer reviewers later said things like all the evidence indicates that the patient was suffering from a solitary parathyroid adenoma at the time, removal would have been curative with a normal life expectancy. He would have had surgery to remove the overactive parathyroid gland, he would have been cured and would still have been alive today. Now, that is quite unequivocal. Uh, research also tells us that the procedure to deal with the situation and remove the uh, adenoma has a 96% success rate with a 1% complication rate. And our family experience has also borne this out because three months after Kevin's death, his dad presented with the very same levels with which Kevin first presented. And we saw him have the procedure successfully, which Kevin should have enjoyed. And he is alive and well today, almost 15 years later. So there were wonderful odds in Kevin's favour, but you could say nobody was at the races. It's also interesting that the condition is fam familial. Our daughter in recent months has had surgery and uh, the mutant gene has been identified. So, of course, there will be ongoing work there. But so much could have been done for Kevin, and he'd be part of that, be part of that ongoing monitoring. So the necessary referral to an endocrinologist did not happen. The diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism was not made, and hypercalcemia was allowed to progress for a further year in 10 months, by which time the levels were higher than any ever recorded in Cork University Hospital and were described as inconsistent with life. Kevin spent the summer of 99 in the United States on his J-1 visa, had a wonderful time there. I have absolute sympathy for the person who, who owned the, the condo where he and something like 18 friends spent those weeks. Uh, but that's another story. On his return, he attended the GP complaining of lethargy, occasional vomiting and continuing bone pain. Blood and urine samples were taken and the results were telephoned to the surgery the next day. Now, that was done because the laboratory were concerned, of course, about the high calcium level, now at 5.73. We're going off the Richter scale. Uh, and, of course, uh, the, uh, this post-it note was actually written by the practice nurse, 
uh, when she took the message over the phone. And when going to the GP, she actually offered him the diagnosis of hypercalcemia, obviously as a result of the conversation she had with the lab people, but he chose to ignore her and went with his own differential diagnosis of leptospirosis on the basis of some of the other, um, uh, the other findings. Now we did learn later that he had experienced some success with diagnosing leptospirosis in a number of people. And the only conclusion I can draw is that this was an instance where you know how experience can serve you well, but sometimes it can cause tunnel vision. And that's exactly what happened in this case. Uh, he, in, when writing his letter of referral to the hospital, he made absolutely no mention of the high calcium levels, only included the test results in the body of the letter, which supported his own diagnosis, leaving out the calcium result, although he did send the post-it note with the letter. In fact, he filtered those results. Then that situation was further compounded in the hospital because, as you can appreciate, uh, a post-it note, they didn't want that lost. So somebody in admin stuck that post-it note to the back of the letter so it wouldn't be lost. And as a consequence, it wasn't seen by anybody in that hospital until six weeks after Kevin's death. The standard blood test in the hospital didn't uh, cover for calcium, so they, didn't, uh, they weren't aware of the high calcium levels, either through the communications or through their own independent testing. So at this time, no medical personnel seemed to appreciate how ill Kevin had become and as his condition certainly deteriorated rapidly. And I recall speaking to the consultant in the hospital corridor on the afternoon before Kevin was transferred to Cork University Hospital. And I remember saying to him, uh, are you worried at all about the delay in his transfer? Because I have this desperate sense of urgency. And I had my hand to my chest just like this. And again, to me, it was that umbilical cord um, kicking in again. And his older brother said, um, and what will they do differently in CUH? And the doctor responded, saying, oh, they'll do nothing differently. Perhaps they'll take a biopsy Monday or Tuesday. Now, we were speaking on Saturday. Kevin died on Sunday. For Kevin, there was no Monday. For Kevin, there was no Tuesday. Again, you ignore at your peril the concerns of a mother. Despite his continuing decline, no alarm was raised. He became dehydrated, described muscle pain and neurological problems. His medical notes quote him as saying, I have crazy thoughts coming into my head. Uh, and those notes also show advancing renal failure. In fact, he was a textbook case of of primary hyperparathyroidism, moans, bones, and groans. The only piece that was missing is the stones. He didn't have gallstones. The hospital did not benefit from his original blood test results almost two years previously, and more recently from the, off the Richter uh, scale calcium levels of 5.73. The absence of complete records and proper communication between primary and secondary care professionals were certainly significant contributory factors to the outcome. And I do remember one of the peer reviewers himself, an endocrinologist, saying that he had trawled globally among colleagues and was unable to come up with somebody who had encountered a patient with such high levels of calcium. So certainly what Kevin was presenting with should have been setting off alarm bells left, right and centre. But two days were lost during his stay in that hospital as there were further missed opportunities. As yet, another point of contact failed him. Finally, he was transferred to Cork University Hospital. It was a weekend admission, and it was here that we first heard the word calcium mentioned in relation to Kevin, with his level now at 6.1. He was managed at registrar level, a registrar who didn't call senior personnel. More aggressive treatments weren't available at the weekend. Uh, and I suppose he fell through what you might call the weekend crack. 
During Sunday, he was lucid, he was very sleepy, gave a thumbs up to his father before he left the bedside. I remember it was an All-Ireland final day, and his sister was relaying to him what was going on on the television. Prior to that, he was really unhappy that Jordan had been knocked out of the Formula One. So he was lucid, he was with it. And uh, uh, his dad and brother went off to, to see the match at home. Nobody had intimated that he was in any uh, real danger at this point in time. And the young SHO came, checked on him, turned away, and before he reached the door of ICU, Kevin suffered a massive heart attack and died as his sister and I sat at the bedside. We were ushered out, we need, to, we need to work on him. And I sent her rushing through the hospital corridors. And it all happened so quickly that she actually caught up with her dad and brother before we, they reached the car in the, par, uh, the, in the car park. A nurse and a doctor came to us and said, uh, the nurse said, we have a room over here. And I said, shook my head and said, it's not good you're taking us to this room. So when we went in, the doctor said Kevin was very sick. And I said, is he gone? And he said, yes. And without any discussion with anyone else in the family, I put the question, what about organ donation? And I know where that came from, because Kevin himself carried a donor card. And the doctor shook his head. Kevin had been allowed to deteriorate to the point where his organs were of no use to any other human being. And for me, his mum, that was really hard. Uh, it was almost like Kevin dying twice. But the doctor was a sensitive man, and he realised that. And he said, uh, would you like us to inquire about his eyes? And I said, yes. So his corneas were donated. And we later learned that a 60-year-old man and a 42-year-old woman now have sight. And that is Kevin's patient journey a journey which could have been considerably shortened and successfully shortened had appropriate interventions occurred during his contact, especially with primary care. And when we reflect on the journey, of course we can identify those shortcomings, the inability to recognize the seriousness of his conditions, appropriate interventions not taken timely, selective and incomplete transmission of information, non receiving of vital information. I would certainly think that if you're sending something of consequence to a colleague, the least you need to be assured of is that it has reached its destination. The absence of that integrated care pathway, the link between his behavior and the test results not made, his developing neurological pro problems ignored, and no evidence of tracking of his deteriorating condition. When we had access to the files, we plotted those test results ourselves. No, we couldn't interpret them. We weren't equipped to do that. But anyone would see that something very significant was happening because the numbers were changing so drastically. There was no evidence uh, as I say, of tracking those. And the, then there was the absence of direct communication with the patient and with the family. There was his treatment at re registrar level. What stops uh, members of team raising the alarm? Why did he not uh, call senior personnel? I can only conjecture. I can say maybe it was a macho thing. They're not called on my watch. Maybe it was, well, I did call a couple of weeks ago and I got quite a basting for doing that and not putting myself out there. So maybe these are the questions we need to ask. We need to ask the five whys. Why do you think, why, why, why peel the onion till we get to the real base and the nub of the matter. And there was the team dynamic. What do you do when you're the boss? How do you facilitate junior members of team to speak up? And what do you do when you're that junior member team? How can you get your voice heard all in the interest of the patient? And there was, of course, the impact of the weekend admission. And in fact, wasn't the patient asked to accommodate the system? Please stay alive until Monday. And Kevin just could not do that. And of course, our expectations of a tertiary training hospital were not met. And then in the aftermath, how does healthcare deal with adverse events? Um, 
Yes, there were, what was our experience? Yes, there were initial honest and humane reactions from individuals, and I'll always be grateful for that. In particular, I remember the nurse. She sat at the bedside with me. She was rubbing my arm, and she was crying as freely as I was. And I, we were in ICU, and I put the question to her, but don't you see this every day? And she said, oh, no, not that. That should never have happened. She was clearly disgusted. And to my dying day, I will be so grateful to her for her honesty. She just told it as it was. But in a short space of time, that was replaced by a process of damage limitation as the system and the organization kicked in. Uh, one doctor described his dilemma as an issue of loyalty to colleagues. And I can certainly appreciate that. But my response to him at the time was in the light of the outcome. Isn't that misplaced and ill-deserved? Uh, and I'll bring up the post-it note again because the head of department suggested in relation to the post-it note that even if it had been seen by his consultant colleague, it would not have meant anything to him. And of course, I wanted to explain, uh, I wanted him to explain that. And he said, well, it's not written as we'd write it. So I asked to see it again, and I said, are you saying that because it's not written in scientific notation, it wouldn't mean anything to somebody like you? And the man actually said yes. A suggestion that CL might not mean calcium, SOD might not mean sodium, POT might not mean potassium, and they all in each other's company. And I have to say it was at that point that I lost faith. I lost any sense of the possibility to having a decent and honest encounter with individuals and the system. We're not a litigious family, but it was respond that response which drove us down the litigation route because we needed to have answers. We needed the truth. It also became very clear that the legal system favours the defendants in these cases, especially in the areas of finance and resources. For ordinary people like ourselves, it was a David and Goliath experience. Until the 11th hour, every effort was made to have a settle without admission of liability. We weren't interested in money. We wanted the answers. We wanted somebody to take responsibility. We wanted the organisation. We didn't want heads on plates, but we wanted truth. And I suppose what I'm really saying that is that cases like ours need to be heard in a non-adversarial environment where the focus is not in blame, but rather on honestly arriving at the truth, acknowledging what happened, identifying ways to prevent occurrence, above all, learning from the tragedy. Open disclosure, I think, has to be part of the culture of each organisation if learning and improvement are to be achieved. And for me, disclosure is not about blame. It's not about apportioning blame. It's not about accepting blame. It's actually about integrity. And it is about being truly professional. And that is what you are. You're professional people. And we expect that you would behave professionally. We can't change the past, as I have said, but we can use the past to inform the present and then influence the future. And that is, the disclosure is a very real and effective tool in bringing that about. Almost five years later, a judge of the High Court declared, it is very clear to me that Kevin Murphy should not have died. Two GPs, a private consultant, a hospital consultant, and a hospital, all admitted liability, expressed their regret at Kevin's death, and sympathised with us as a family. Certainly something which could have been done within months of Kevin's death and without the five years of trauma and uncertainty brought about, brought about by the litigation process and the inappropriate responses which drove us down that route. Now, sadly, those apologies were made by legal representatives. They were not made in person. So there is a bit of a question over the sincerity of those, of those apologies. Monetary compensation was never an issue for us as a family. The truth is the sum of money doesn't, equate, it doesn't even exist that would equate to my Kevin. 
and neither could we see any circumstances in which we would derive benefit or pleasure from that money, buy a car, go on holiday, do home improvements. Uh, so consequently, ever before we knew whether there would even be a settlement, we signed off anything of that nature to two named charities, Boher and the Make-A-Wish Foundation. So what about healthcare staffs? How do they fare in this kind of scenario? Patients can't give permission for error. However, we are intelligent people. We know that you work in a high-risk environment, uh, that medicine is complex and that it's, risk -laden uh, it's a risk-laden endeavor. And I accept unreservedly that no one intended harm to Kevin. And I would like to speak about three people. You have met one. The, the, the head of department with the nonsense about the post-it note. The second one was the young SHO who dealt with Kevin for a number of hours. And he and Kevin actually went to the same school. They didn't know each other in school because of the age difference, but they did have a nice rapport in the few hours. And that same day, when we, just when we'd left the man about the post-it, we were coming down a corridor and he crossed over and he said, hello, Mr. and Mrs. Murphy, how are you doing? Kevin was very unlucky. And I was shocked. Unlucky? And we're in the last year of the millennium in a first world country in a tertiary training hospital and somebody is using the word luck. And I was mad. I was really angry. But I wasn't angry at him. I was angry at the organisation that left him with such a superficial understanding of what had happened. And they hadn't given him any opportunity to learn from it. And the reason I was angry, and the reason I wasn't angry at him, was because I really liked him. And the reason I liked him was because in the afternoon of Kevin's death, Kevin's friends started coming to the hospital. They were sitting in the corridors, head in hands, trying to come to terms with what had happened. And he passed by. And what did he do? He took off his white coat, the barrier. He boiled it up and he put it on the ground next to them and he sat with them. At first glance, an amazing act of solidarity, you know? But the more I thought of it, you know, you can't teach a fella to do that. That's not in any textbook. That came, that came from the innate goodness inside that young man. And here I see a situation where nobody's identifying that. Who's going to nurture that? Who's going to keep that going? And chances were he was feeling a bit more at ease in the company of Kevin's friends because he too was grieving. And, you know, it was quite overwhelming for that young man. And clearly he would have been advised, you have to get back up on the horse. And I accept that, of course it have to. But aren't there some horses that you actually need a bit of a leg up? And I certainly got the feeling that that young man wasn't getting that leg up. There was also the registrar, the man who didn't make the call and should have made the call. Again that very same day, we're about to exit a lift and he enters and our eyes lock. And he's clearly trying to place me, and of course I recognise him. And all I say to him is, I'm Kevin Murphy's mother. And his face changed, and he blurted out the words, I didn't think he'd die. And he backed out of the lift, and he ran away down the corridor. He literally ran away. And I turned to my husband because we'd just come from that man with that awful nonsense about the post-it. And I said to him, oh my God, they've abandoned us, but they've abandoned him too. Where did he go? Did he have any support? Did anybody care about him? This was six weeks after Kevin's death and the man was in a mess. Even as Kevin's mother, I felt that that was wrong. And he and I never had the conversation the conversation which should have been facilitated. It would have been a difficult conversation. There would have been tears, there perhaps would have been anger, but I'm totally convinced we would both have come away in a better frame of mind. So it's obvious that the current adversarial system doesn't serve anyone well. He and us as a family would have been far better served and it would have been more beneficial to us all uh, if there had been some system in place 
where we could have addressed those things early on, rather than the, if you like, the organisation getting locked into defending a lawsuit, rather than identifying improvement measures and putting those in place. So if I've learned anything from this, it has forced me to kind of compile my Margaret Murphy wish list, which says things like observe the existing guidelines, best practice, and be prepared to challenge each other in that regard. You know, that really, that's the best gift you can give a colleague. Listen to respect patients and families, and especially the carers. Know your personal limitations. We must all stretch ourselves, but we have to know where to stop. Keep the impeccable records. Actually, Kevin's records were really very good, but they might have been, you know, they may as well not have been written because there was no action arising out of them. And communicate effectively within the medical community. And above all, acknowledge error and allow the learning to occur. Undertake the root cause analysis, the system failure analysis. Replicate what is good and identify opportunities to improve. And you, it, it, won't, it doesn't take 40 question questionnaires to patients to find out all of this stuff. It, it takes the three questions. What worked? The two questions. What are the three things that worked for you while you were in this hospital? And what are the three things you'd like changed? You will very soon get themes. Learn, disseminate the learning practice, the dialogue and the collaboration, the meaningful engagement, and create a coalition of healthcare professionals and patients. And I was delighted to hear one of the, see one of the tweets this morning spoke about setting up a patient engagement, patient and family engagement group. Be honest and open and seize the opportunity to give some meaning to tragedy. And Sir Liam Donaldson says the five most dangerous words are it couldn't happen here. Yeah, it can to anyone, anywhere. And again, I'll repeat, acknowledge the error and allow the learning to occur. And it is because of all of that that I would like to share with you something around my first meeting with Sir Liam Donaldson, chair of the World Alliance for Patient Safety. It was at the time when they were setting up that alliance and he, Kevin's case came to his attention and he identified it as a learning tool and wanted to use it himself in conferences and I was invited to go and speak with him. And that happened in London, and I remember walking, he walking into that room in Whitehall, extending his hand and saying, Hello, Margaret, I'm Liam Donaldson, sit down, talk to me. Sit down, talk to me. In five long years, nobody has said that. And he listened, and he heard, and there's a difference. He didn't offer excuses. He uh, acknowledged that something happened that should not have happened. And then he enumerated on his fingertips the number of missed opportunities. And finally, he turned to me and he said, and do you know, Margaret, any one of them would have been enough. And he likened Kevin's patient journey to Jim Reason's Swiss cheese model. And I returned home to Ireland, a considerably healed woman, conscious of acknowledgement, conscious of being heard, and conscious of the possibility of being part of the change process. And the magic he worked was that he validated the patient experience. And that's what I'm asking each of you to do. And then isn't there also the wonderful story of Dr. Rick Van Pelt and Linda Kenny in the United States? He was the anest Am I OK on time? He was the anesthesiologist who, um, who made the error and she flatlined. And he, he, now, you know the kind of individual we're talking about because in college he was known as Iceman. But when this happened, he actually connected with part of himself that even he didn't know existed. And he had this desperate longing to meet with her and explain. And of course, everybody said no, insurers, hospital colleagues. And he sat with that for a while. And then, eventually, they did meet. And yes, it was a difficult first meeting, the doctor and the woman he almost killed. But he says, and I've heard him say it at conferences, because they co-present at conferences now, uh, that on that day, an 800-pound gorilla got off my back. Now, isn't that some image, to be toting around an 800-pound gorilla 24-7, and you can actually get shot of it by having a decent conversation with another human being? They also set up the organisation Medically Induced Trauma Support Services, which supports patient, family, and clinician when things go wrong. So 
Again, what I am reiterating is, is that in, insensitive responses to families actually create new patients. The trauma arising from how we are received can sometimes be even more damaging than the event itself. Reputations and professionalism are far better served by openness and honesty than by that collegiality and secrecy and cover-up, because that's actually sabotaging the system, which we all want to bring to a state of excellent excellence. And that conduct also does undermine public confidence in the integrity of the very professionals who do hold our lives in, in, in their hands and who we want to be able to hold in high regard. So maybe one of the first things we have to do is try and find out why do essentially decent and professional people often behave in this inhumane way in the aftermath of an adverse event? And they're the things that we need to address. I'd like to make, make a little comment too around system and culture because taking personal responsibility seems to have become a bit of a taboo in recent times and very often error is attributed to system failure. And of course, the com a combination is more likely to be the truth, but system failure is a way of sanitizing what, if you like, has happened. Uh, uh, I suppose the I sit on the Medical Council, and yesterday I was at a meeting where we were actually screen, where we screen complaints and decide whether they go forward for FTP or not. And I can tell you that without a doubt, nearly every complaint does have an individual component in it. A lot of it around communication styles, around behaviours, and how people were treated. So we need to look at the whole thing. So, and I'd also say something called a system didn't walk through the front door of our institutions with its thumbs and its braces and say, I'm running the show from now on. Any of the systems were designed by people. They're maintained by people and they can jolly well be changed by people. And you're the very people who can bring about that kind of, cha of change. So people are the culture. People are the system. You deserve satisfying professional career, and we patients deserve safe and compassionate care. And an effective safety culture is one in which the system, the organization, and the individual practitioners can demonstrate certain things. And there's a comfort to themselves in being able to demonstrate things like their level of adherence to procedures, best practice, their commitment to the oaths and to the guidance and the ethical guides of the various professions, that they practice inclusively, which is reflective of their engagement and partnership with patients, and their Above all, their transparent and open handling of critical incidents, supporting patients, families and staff. That, acknowledge, that a combination of acknowledging our achieving learning, preventing recurrence and allowing staffs to recover and to be more effective in the future. There is no benefit in wiping a person, dismissing somebody from healthcare. Remediation is far, far better. So what is critical is that we preserve that very valuable relationship of trust between doctor and patient. There is no acceptable level of error, but it will occur, and it is at that time that we're challenged to behave properly. The onus is on each of us to see that translated into safer care from the raise and death of healthcare. And the raise and death of healthcare isn't a system, it's the man in the bed and also ensuring a real sense of satisfaction for those working in healthcare. And that can only be brought about by dialogue, which has been described as powerful conversation. And it's for that reason that I'm really happy to articulate once again the um, patient for patient safety um, statement, which we, it was actually the London Declaration. It was an output from our first workshop, which said, in honour of those who've died, those who've been left disabled, our loved ones today will strive for excellence so that all people receiving healthcare will be as safe as possible, as soon as possible. That's our pledge of partnership. It's our patient pledge of partnership. You were asked to make pledges this morning, and it's undoubtedly my Margaret Murphy pledge of partnership. 
So the challenge, as always, is to, if you like, translate aspiration into some kind of reality. Eric Honegel's reflection on patient safety is apt, I think, in these times, where there's really a very, uh, an enormous emphasis on evidence base, and rightly so. But he says that safety is a core value, not a commodity that can be counted. Safety shows itself only by the events that do not happen. So how do you measure a negative? While also Atul Gwande, the internationally respected surgeon, wrote in the um, New Yorker last year, uh, he, uh, he says that more than anything, what distinguishes the great from the mediocre is not so much that they fail less, it's that they rescue more. And that's the piece about the deteriorating patient. And I think that would be a good place for us to kind of lay greater emphasis, that we would strive to be rescuers. And certainly during his care, there were many, many opportunities for rescue in relation to Kevin, but nobody came, stepped up to the plate in that regard. And finally, I was present at Kevin's birth. I know every detail of that birth. And I was also present when he died. And as his mother, I needed and I deserved to know everything about the circumstances which brought that about. But over and above that, I needed to be assured that lessons would be learned, that those lessons would be disseminated all in the hope of preventing recurrence. Because Sir Liam Donaldson says, and I totally agree with it, to wear is human. To cover up is unforgivable, but to refuse to learn is inexcusable. Thank you.